you enter the cave. It's barely big enough to stand up in. The floor is absolutely strewn with the bodies of people you probably knew. Maybe they were family. Maybe you had peeled the flesh from their bones yourself. You go further and further in, and the cave gets smaller and smaller until you're crawling on your belly across the rocks. The daylight now vanished. The cave is only illuminated by your small stone lamp. In the distance, you hear fire and the sound of water. You enter a second chamber. A fire fills the cave with smoke. You can see just enough to make out a lake, but beyond that, total darkness. You're handed a drink by some kind of shaman, perhaps. It's ice cold. You're not sure, but it looks like, in the darkness, a lone skull is watching you from the wall. The Neolithic lifestyle had been making its way across the Aegean since 7000 BCE, reaching the Adriatic about 700 years later by around 6300 BCE. Excavations at Sidari in Corfu have revealed early examples of impressor ware, the pottery incised with mollusk shells that would become characteristic of the central Mediterranean in the Neolithic period. As these farmers had been island hopping their way around the Aegean, the 72 km strait of Otranto was not a huge obstacle for them, apparently. Neolithic farming lifestyles were widespread across southern Italy and Sicily by 6000 BCE. Initially, communities were defined by small isolated farms as pioneers spread across the land, but these soon developed into larger villages such as Paso di Corvo. As with everywhere else in the Neolithic, they followed the oats and goats diet. I've covered that in plenty of videos before, so uh, I shall say no more. The religious practices of Neolithic Italy are unique for their time, though. Throughout Italy's rugged terrain, there are many thousands of caves, and in these caves we can see that vast arrays of different rituals were performed. Sacrificial offerings, burials, fertility rites, strange paintings of possible shamans, and some caves were just home, they were just lived in. Through the surviving archaeological evidence, we can really see a huge amount of complexity and diversity in the behavior and ritual of these Neolithic folks. I don't think it's possible to do the whole of Italy justice in one video, so I'm not going to even try. Instead, today I want to focus on just one brilliant example from Apulia, Grotta Scaloria, just to give us a little taste of what these ancient people were up to. Behind this unassuming door, under a small field in southern Italy, sits Grotta Scaloria. Scaloria Cave consists of two chambers, connected by a narrow and long gallery. The first chamber, Scaloria Alta, is a large opening, 80 meters by 100 meters, and is about 2 meters high at the tallest point, so just big enough to stand up in. This chamber contained the burials of possibly 137 individuals, organized seemingly into groups of 20, and other than a few examples, they were entirely disarticulated. Mainly young people aged below 15 to 20, but some older people too, the oldest being probably around 50. Women also outnumbered men 2 to 1. Clearly, many died young in the Neolithic, this is not unusual for pre-industrial societies, high birth rate, high mortality. Strontium analysis of the bones suggests that they came from the surrounding 15 to 20 kilometers, so these were people from local Neolithic villages buried here. They weren't deposited in one go, the burials span the course of several centuries, so this wasn't a massacre or anything like that. However, it's really important to note that I am using the term burial very, very lightly here. The remains are pretty much smashed to bits and seem to have been casually discarded on the cave floor, no graves dug or anything like that. At least 24 of them, possibly more, were also defleshed. The bones are covered in cut marks. 
One skull was seemingly cut down the middle and the skin peeled off either side. Pretty gruesome. Why go to the effort of cleaning the bones only to smash them up, casually discard them on the floor with pots and animal bones, seemingly of no further ritual use? What is the social purpose behind this act? They must have done it for a reason. These were people from their own community. Well, John Robb et al. have ideas about that. Secondary burial rites often involve prolonged interaction with the dead during a period in which they are liminal beings, spirits remaining nearby, or memories being actively mourned. Here, the transformation from entirely living to entirely dead beings had to be accomplished by degrees, and cleaning and discarding the bone was the last detectable stage. Final deposition could perhaps have signaled a termination of this period of liminality, the moment at which the deceased reached stability and no longer hovering and threatening, at which the living could reemerge from mourning. The second chamber, Scaloria Bassa, is reached via a very long, steep, and narrow gallery, only big enough to crawl through. This really does take some effort to reach. The chamber is slightly smaller than Scaloria Alta, it's, it's not quite big enough to stand up in, and it ends in a small lake. It's here, in this chamber, that we have outstanding evidence for religious activity, and it really marks Grotta Scaloria as an absolutely incredible archaeological site. In front of the lake, a rectangular basin was carved into the bedrock, presumably to collect water dripping from above. Around the basin, the stalagmites had their tops removed to create a flat surface, and fine Neolithic pottery was placed on top of these platforms. Seventy pots were recovered all in all, some of them still sitting in place on the stalagmites intact as they had been 7,000 years ago. This is incredibly rare, I mean this is an exceptional site. Again, presumably these pots were to collect water dripping from the ceiling. In front of the carved basin was evidence for a large fire that contained the remains of animal bones. Finally, there was one human burial here, some other scattered human bones, and fascinatingly, a lone skull had been placed in a natural fissure in the rock overlooking this whole scene. I mean, what can we make of this site? It's, it's spectacular. The archaeologists that first entered the cave in the 1930s the first people probably to enter in 7,000 years must have been astounded. I'd have felt like Howard Carter peeking into Tutankhamun's tomb. We can only imagine the rituals that took place here. What did they do in the basin? Why collect water from the ceiling? What role did water play in their religion? What role did that small lake play? Was this some sort of transitional place where the world of the dead met the world of the living? Who did the skull in the wall belong to? The mind truly boggles at the possibilities. Okay. Whoa! I fell in the ice. Shit. I'm supposed to be in a cave right now, and as you can probably tell by the fact that I just sank two foot into the ice, I can't make it. I can't get in there. It's, uh, it's frozen over. It's somewhere around here, but it's totally frozen over, and I'm not an absolute psychopath and willing to go into a frozen over cave for the sake of a video. But in a way, it illustrates my uh, point that I was hoping to make even better. I just wish I hadn't woken up at 5 a.m. to drive three hours to stand in the ice. But I was a little bit apprehensive, I'm not going to lie to you. I was apprehensive about going into a cave on my own. Which brings me to the point that I'm trying to make. I don't believe it's difficult to imagine why these Neolithic people uh, chose to worship in caves or had, you know complicated spiritual beliefs around caves. They're very dark. They're very cold. They echo. Whenever you're in one, if you've been in one, it still kind of makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. 
And I don't believe in spirits or gods or anything like that. And yet I'm still apprehensive about it. There's something uncomfortable about it, otherworldly about it, you might say. So if I feel like that in the modern world, believing what I believe, knowing what I know, imagine if you were one of these Neolithic people who presumably sincerely believed in their religion and in their worldview. How sort of, I don't know what the word would be, uh, how sort of powerful that experience would be of going through these caves, especially in Grotta Scaloria. If you think about it, that crawl through the darkness, through that extremely low, narrow tunnel for many, many meters, illuminated only by a small lamp or a torch. I th can't help but think it would be a really powerful and profound and scary religious experience for them. And it's so interesting to me, really. The past really is another world, especially seven, 8,000 years ago. Places like Grotta Scaloria and just trying to imagine what they were doing and what they'd have thought and, and the rituals they'd have taken part in. Stuff like that really drives my uh, passion for prehistory. I absolutely love it. Big thanks to Carlton Grover from a Life in Ruins podcast for doing that little uh, voiceover of the article for me. They interviewed me on their podcast and it's going to be coming out around the same time as this video. I'm not sure when I'm going to finish editing this video, so just follow them. Listen to their podcast. It's great. You'll love it. It's all archaeology, anthropology themed, of course, like my channel. And uh, so thanks for him for helping me with this video. Thanks to my Patreons for supporting me, as always, especially these top tier Patreons whose generosity knows no bounds. I'm absolutely freezing. Uh, I think I'm going to get off this ice before I sink in it again and just go home. I brought, I brought pasta and everything I was going to eat in the cave. I had the whole day planned out, but... Probably should have checked the weather before I left. Oh well. Skiddly do, guys. Skiddly do. I even wore shorts. Skiddly do. Ciao, sono Ettore Mazza e sono l'autore delle illustrazioni che spesso vedete su questo canale. Sono un illustratore fumettista italiano e se vi è piaciuto questo episodio o vi piace la preistoria in generale, potrebbe interessarvi un fumetto che ho scritto e disegnato. Il titolo è Il sentiero delle ossa e racconta la storia di un ragazzo all'arrivo del Neolitico in Europa. Trovate comunque tutte le informazioni in descrizione o nel primo commento.